I've turned to the concept of disposability to try to explain the numbers of deaths in custody that I see. People who die at the hands of the police, uh, indigenous women who die at the hands of various killers. I've tried to explain what it is that causes this much violent death and how is it that we approve of such deaths as a society. And so disposability as a concept, uh, while it is very harsh, uh, is useful because it describes how people become uh, or are placed into a category of disposable people, that is to say a category of people you can throw away, people whose lives have very little value, no value at all, people who are in fact targeted, uh, who become waste. So for me, who are the disposable people of the world? At the present, these are people, I would place all indigenous people in that category. Uh, these are uh, populations against whom all manner of violence is permissible. I would consider asylum seekers who drown in the Mediterranean or who die in the deserts of Mexico and Arizona. Uh, all of these groups of people are disposable people uh, whose lives uh, matter not at all. This possibility can be understood broadly as the production of human waste, which is the way that Sigmund Bauman explained it in his book, Wasted Lives. In his words, the production of human waste, or as he uh, added more correctly, wasted humans, is an inevitable outcome of modernization. And what he means by that is, is that it is, an, in, again in his words, an inescapable side effect of order building. Each order produces a population that is unfit, out of place, undesirable. And economic progress requires that a population be left behind as unfit uh, waste. When I apply the concept of disposability to indigenous peoples, I start with the fact that indigenous peoples are what I would consider the premier disposable group in the sense that they are the group that stands in the way of the order building of capitalist accumulation, of racial capitalist accumulation. But I do try in my own work to make this as specific as possible. How is it that indigenous people are disposed of? In Dying from Improvement, which is a book I uh, wrote about indigenous deaths in custody, I considered how it comes to be that so many indigenous people can die in police custody without actually uh, causing any ruffles in society. And uh, I turned to the, the patterns of policing around indigenous people and very specifically the relentless policing of indigenous peoples in settler cities in Canada. Uh, the goal for the police is to rid the city of indigenous people, to cleanse the city of indigenous people. And this understanding of indigenous people as waste that have to be disposed of is something that then produces white citizens as the original entitled citizens. And so indigenous people who stand in the way of capitalist accumulation and who stand in the way of this racial project are simply produced as waste who, who must be gotten rid of. Because indigenous people are regarded as waste, because they're regarded as standing in the way, there is no objection to their deaths. And that's the problem that I really wanted to think about. How does it come to be? that the deaths of indigenous people in this way arouse so little concern. I understand disposability as a spatial process, and this is something that I have uh, drawn on geographers for, because they enable me 
to track how disposability happens. For example, as, as Laura Hudson uh, remarks, those who are viewed as surplus are penned in to spaces like the prison, penned in to spaces of poverty and marginality, both in and outside the city. And these are spaces where a vigorous policing unfolds and where there is a social abandonment. So marked for death, cast out as excess, as the detritus of modern society, populations who are disposable can be tracked spatially. As uh, scholars have, have emphasized, these are populations that are considered people who cannot be improved, who cannot contribute to the modern, and who therefore must be evicted to spaces of death and marginality. There are significant differences in waste disposal. There are gender differences in strategies of waste disposal. The feminist scholar Melissa Wright, for example, has argued that third world women are turned into industrial waste, a form of industrial waste, when they are used up in factory work and considered worthless after a short time and at a very young age. So here you have an entire industry that is predicated on the disposability of third world women doing this kind of work. If I were then to gender it with respect to indigenous people, I would start with the fact that while all indigenous peoples are surveilled, pushed, prodded, violently evicted from settler spaces, these processes, when they concern indigenous women, are very likely to involve sex, whether forced or contracted for. Sexualized violence, in other words, is very key to how colonial regimes engage in gender disposability. And understanding how this operates requires us to understand how a class of women is created and identified as available, not just for sexual exploitation, but for disposability. Sex work, or the less popular term that I use, prostitution, is dangerous work. A tremendous amount of violence is associated with it. And the problem that I consider is why is it that the violence in sex industries can occur with relative impunity? And why is it there's so much of it? With respect to indigenous women, I wrote about the murder of Pamela George, a Cree woman, who was murdered by two white college students who had picked her up for sex, took her outside of the city and murdered her. It took some time before they were even caught, and when the two men were tried, the court was inclined to consider that the men were just boys being boys. Pamela George was considered as someone who knew that what she was doing was risky work. What enabled this kind of uh, logic to stand was a consideration of Pamela George, not as a person, but as flesh, to be used up, rented for the night, and discarded. Exactly the same logic, a logic that I call a logic of disposability, was actually in operation for the murder of Cindy Gladue, a Cree woman who bled to death in a hotel room. She had been uh, contracted, she had contracted with Bradley Barton to provide sexual services. Barton was a white man, he worked as a trucker, and he had purchased her sexual services on two occasions before. On this occasion, the defense, his defense maintained that Cindy bled to death from a tear that occurred during an episode of rough sex when he inserted his fists into her vagina. The Crown argued that the wound actually had been caused by a knife. In a bid to demonstrate its theory about the knife, and on the advice of the senior pathologist in the case, Cindy Gladue's vagina, a the tissue apparently severed from the rest of her body, was introduced into the courtroom. 
the judge permitted the severed part of the pelvic area to be viewed on a screen. Both Barton and the court treated Cladieu as flesh, bringing her vaginal tissue into the courtroom, for example, reduced her to a body part. Barton himself, in renting and then disposing of her for the night, is also in this moment treating her as a body part. And so what I propose with the concept of disposability is to connect this reduction to a body part to its annihilation, to throwing it away. And that's how I want to connect disposability to the violence and annihilation of indigenous women. It is difficult to work out how disposability works in the context of the sexual contract. There are many, many unanswered questions here. I, I have turned to uh, a brilliant article by Ranjana Khanna where she offers an analytical framework for understanding how disposability actually operates in the sexual contract. So Khanna reminds us of two meanings of the word disposable. Disposable is something you throw away after use because it has become excessive or a waste. She gives the example of a disposable camera. And it is something that is available for use or consumption, something that we don't actually need that is in excess of our need, but we uh, use it. And the example there is disposable income. And then there's a third meaning, which is what one is disposed to do, what one wants to do. And kind of offers the example of Christopher Marlowe's 16th century play Tamberlin as having all of these meanings in it. So uh, in the play, prostitutes are, as she describes it, available. They're part of the infrastructure of Tamberlin's mobile army, and they're disposable. They're available for libidinal excess, as well as being discardable objects. And uh, Kana makes the point that this constitutes a very interesting early case of disposable people, prostitutes as disposable people. And in the play, the Emperor Timur demands that the harlots, as, as, as it's described in the play, of the opposing Turkish army be brought to his tent announcing that he would dispose of them as he wished. I'm struck by this because for a fee, a John can be Timur, disposing of a prostitute as he wishes for the night. The contract here provides the right of disposability. If I were to understand the role of law in disposability, uh, I could return again to the example provided by, by Kana. She observes that it's really hard to determine which particular meaning of disposability is operating in the case of the prostitute. She writes, for example, can the prostitute be killed, thrown away as an expendable object, exiled, made into a refugee, made into an asylum seeker? Can she be the source of investment? an embodied form of affective labor? Could there be a sovereign decision, the law, to make her live or let her die if she's deemed excessive at any point? What does the law have to say about her death? And in considering this question of the law, it's useful to turn to the example of slavery, modern slavery. Kana reminds us that we already have the example in law of a category of human being who is transformed into disposable matter. She draws on uh, Françoise Verger, who considers the legal status of the category of human beings who are transformed into disposable matter. And here I, I, I like to quote her because I think this is an important point about the role of law. Modern slavery creates gray zones in which life becomes matter, where no form of law offers any protection. 
where a blind eye is act actively turned and where the disposability of peoples becomes not exceptional, but the byproduct of capitalist excess. In this formulation, capitalism's excess is man manifest in, on the one hand, the enjoyment by those of us who can consume with our disposable income, and on the other hand, by the way that others are turned into matter or throwaways. So here, race and gender operating through each other are marked in law as maintaining racialized or colonized women as disposable. How do you actually understand then the limits of these arrangements in the law? As Saidiya Hartman has asked of enslaved women, how do you tell when the law declares that the force that is applied is too much force, when the contract is for you to do as you please? If the slave is property and not human, chattel with whom you can do as you like, how much force is too much force? This for me is the question at the heart of murder trials involving white men murdering indigenous women. How do you determine how much force is too much force in the law when the status of the person who's murdered is not the status of a human being, but the status of property or chattel? It's not hard to see how Cindy Gladue was treated as disposable. Barton entered the arrangement, likely believing that the contract entitled him to use Gladue for his own pleasure. A pleasure that must nevertheless be disavowed, but we can talk about that some other time. This is an arrangement the law condones. The contract is time limited. Gladue was purchased for her sexual services that night, after which her relationship with Barton was over, at least until the next contract. As the disposable object of property, his for the night, it's hard to see the limits of the arrangements. It's the property feature of the prostitution contract that creates the gray area between vigorous thrusting with your fist and using a knife. In that gray area between human and matter, nothing committed against Cindy, Cindy Gladue can be considered a crime which is what Agamben said of the inmates of concentration camps who exist in that gray zone where nothing committed against them can be considered a crime. The law understood Gladue as someone who agreed to be property, someone undertaking dangerous work, someone who was likely to be in a situation of rough sex. But for me, it is really about the disposability of a class of women who have little or no legal protection because they're understood to be surplus, throwaway objects. Women who stand in the way of a racial project of accumulation, even as their bodies are actively mined to provide white men with a sense of their entitlement and their power.